mandolin. That's a sound I never get tired of. To some people, it brings back memories of a Neapolitan love song or a ride in a gondola in Venice. To others, it's perhaps a concerto by Vivaldi. To still others, it's an Appalachian folk song. We're here in this session to focus on the development of the mandolin as an American instrument and as an American art form. To help us do that, we're very fortunate to have with us Tony Williamson, a mandolin expert, a player, the owner of a dealership which buys and sells old mandolins, vintage mandolins all over the world, a second generation musician from rural North Carolina who brings not only a wealth of information today, but a collection of mandolins that's positively spectacular in its breadth and scope and we'll be examining those as we go. Tony, let's get started. Tony, it's a delight to have you with us today. Great to be here, Max. What, what have you got for us? Tony, this is a pretty good example of a European bowlback mandolin, the old style that they played back in Italy and France in the 1700s. This one is made with a set of ribs individually crafted in back and put together to give it its bowl appearance. It's beautiful. Can I try it? Absolutely. I've never tried one of the oh my goodness, how do you get how do you get it close enough to you to play it? That may be why they changed the shape <laughs> in later years. <laughs> they would have to for me. was that? That's the intro of the first big mandolin hit. Mozart's Don Giovanni in 1787 featured the mandolin. In fact, the mandolin flourished in Naples in the mid-1700s. The first family of mandolin builders was a family called Bonacci. Mm -hmm. The uh, immigrants to America brought this instrument with them, and they probably sounded a little more like this. an example of those Neapolitan love songs I was talking about before. Unfortunately, when the American manufacturers tried to copy the bowlbacks, their chief product was a cheap imitation that was inferior in sound and playability. Well, we've got one of those here. This uh, is from the early part of this century, an American design. Very similar in construction and idea to the European bowlbacks, but for some reason, they were never able to produce the kind of sound that the old makers like Calacci and Venacci were able to produce with the superior craftsmanship. Now, I have certainly seen some beautiful examples of bowback mandolins by Washburn or Martin, mm -hmm. quite ornate with pearl inlay, tortoise shell, genuine tortoise shell, gold and silver wire inlay, beautiful instruments that are very collectible even today but not that great in sound. The prominent American mandolin companies included Washburn and Lyon and Healy of Chicago, the Larson Brothers, also of Chicago, the C.F. Martin Company of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, and the Vega Company of Boston. Now, Vega made a model they called the cylinder back, which they were doing some things with the back of the mandolin. I almost consider this instrument to be the missing link. Well, here's an example. This one, uh, made in the teens by Vega, is an example of the cylinder back that you're talking about. And I don't know whether the camera can see it or not, but the back actually has a, a hump in it, which was intended to increase the volume of air in the sound chamber to somewhat approximate the, uh, the volume in the old bowlbacks while still producing a mandolin of somewhat more streamlined design. The development of the American mandolin continued from the cylinder back 
the idea was to try to develop ways to make the instrument have more tone, more volume, more projection. The most astounding creations in this development came from a young manufacturer in Kalamazoo, Michigan named Orville Gibson. What an interesting guy Orville Gibson must have been. In the late 1800s, around 1880, he was building guitars and mandolins and all sorts of creations there in his shop in Kalamazoo. And his ideas were incredibly radical. The shape of the mandolin I'm holding was Orville's artist model style. Notice all the, the curls and points of this instrument. The other radical departures that Orville had on his mandolins where he made the neck and the body one solid piece, made the neck hollow inside to increase the volume of the instrument, radical ideas and designs that soon were left behind as Orville quit making instruments around 1917. The one thing Orville did that has stayed with us to, to this day is he carved the top of his mandolins into an arch, thus making them a speaker like vibrating surface. That's an idea he took from the violin family, I guess, isn't it? it? Exactly. That was Orville's idea to borrow from the violin family, the great Cremona makers, Stradivarius and the Amatis of the uh, 18th century. Orville borrowed the idea of the carved top from those great makers, but he stayed with the oval sound hole, mm -hmm. which was the mandolin standard of the time. Orville created a mandolin that had a nice tone, but it was not so different from those bow backs, don't you think? That's right. It has the same sort of uh, high-pitched uh, timbre that the old bow back mandolins had. In 1902, Orville Gibson sold his incredible ideas to a group of investors there in Kalamazoo and formed the Gibson Mandolin and Guitar Company. Orville stayed on as acoustic engineer but never owned a share of stock in the company that bears his name. I didn't realize that. The, uh, Orville was a creator and an inventor and his ideas, though radical, were, were way ahead of his time and paved the ground for some real constructive work that came later with the Gibson Mandolin and Guitar Company. One of the first things that the company did to change Orville's designs were to increase the neck angle, thus to get more bridge height. They also simplified the design a little bit by making the instrument lose this curl. We have one with us today. Max, if you'll hand it to me. Mm -hmm. the, this unique specimen is in a natural top. It has aged to a beautiful golden color, but it originally was cl a clear finish on the top and a beautiful mm. flame maple on the back and sides. Now, he didn't make this one as a one-piece neck and back and sides, did he? Correct. Well, actually, Orville didn't make this one at all. He was still with the company in 1913 when this instrument was made, but this instrument had a, a separate neck assembly, separate rims bent onto the carved back and carved top. The whole thing was held together by a dovetail joint mm -hmm. here. These beautiful instruments were very popular at the time. This natural top finish was a custom option, however. Most appeared in, in either a sunburst or a black finish, like the one we just saw. Tony, can you play something on that one to give us an idea of what the mandolins of the mid-teens sounded like? I think I'll try to play a popular song from that period called Darling Nellie Gray.
Tony, that was great. You know, watching you play reminds me of what I've heard about the reason that the Gibsons left that little point down there on the bottom, even though they took that top point off. They left that little point there to put against your leg so that while you're playing, you'd have a solid hold on the mandolin. He did a number of other things that were pretty creative. Uh, the Gibson Company came up with a patent on this particular pick guard and pick guard clamp that they put on the side. That was something that uh, had formerly been either inlaid into the top or glued onto the top of the mandolins back in the, in the European days. And along in the mid, uh, I guess the mid Thames, they introduced the German inlaid Handel tuners, the tuners made by Handel. And those stayed on these mandolins, I think, until about 1917 or 1918. That's correct. They, their availability was limited in 1917 because of World War I. Mm -hmm. And Gibson switched to getting their tuners from Waverly, an American mm -hmm. company. Well, Tony, that's been a very nice introduction to the mandolin itself. What about telling us a little bit about how the mandolin family evolved? Well, you know, that's intertwined into this whole theme of violin idea. The legitimate so-called powers that be have always felt that the mandolin was inferior to the violin. Well, the mandolin makers in the, in the teens in America didn't feel that way at all. In fact, they strove to make the mandolin equivalent to the violin in every regard. And one of the innovations that the Gibson Company was doing by 1909 was the mandolin family. The mandolin, the mandola, which I'm holding here, which was tuned a fifth below, like the viola. This was a departure from the European mandola, which was actually an octave mandolin. The, the sound of the mandola was the tenor voice in the mandolin choir. And we'll be playing a mandola a little later in the program as well. But now let me show you the mandocello. This, of course, is the equivalent to the violoncello. And it's the baritone voice in the choir. You know, the violin theme went over to other manufacturers as well. In 1917, Lyon and Healy entered the market to compete with Gibson's violin-like mandolins. I believe Max has brought one of, a beautiful example of the Lyon and Healy Style A Professional. Yes, Tony, the Lyon and Healy Company, uh, trying to match Gibson in terms of innovation, took a little different approach to design, but still adhered to some of the same principles that Orville Gibson had established back around the turn of the century. This is still a carved top. It's a carved back. And even though the look is different, the sound chamber was about the same size and the, and the uh, sound of the instrument was about the same as the Gibson uh, mandolins of the teens. They even went to the ex extent of adapting the violin curlicue to the tops of their artist model mandolins. Yes, that violin scroll peg head is a look and a design that endears this model to many players. It's a very beautiful and delicate yeah, ornamentation on this instrument. The one thing about these instruments that make it remarkable to me is the fact that they seem to have more of that European sound and are preferred by a lot of prominent classical players. More of a classical sound mm -hmm. than, than the Gibson. Now, this mandolin, let me point out, does not have the original bridge. The original bridge mm -hmm. would have been a one-piece affair out of ebony, like all the bridges we've seen so far. The adjustable bridge is an earmark of the exciting period when Lloyd Lohr was acoustical engineer at the Gibson factory. Tony, before we go on to Lloyd Lohr and his innovations at Gibson, tell us about the little innovation that Lyon and Healy put on the side of the mandolin with that little button. That's a neat little peg that pops right out. It's a little metal thing, and it sits on your lap. Anchors mm -hmm. the mandolin much like the point on the F4 model. Lion and Healy Company was very thoughtful and came up with little gadgets like this. Some models even had a 
music stand holder. Well, they certainly made a fine mandolin. Indeed, they did. Well, Tony, by 1918, the Gibson Company was riding high, both as a manufacturer and a distributor of, of instruments with uh, mandolin orchestras in about every city in the country and mandolin clubs in just about every college. Uh, with all of this success, why do you think they thought they needed some kind of change in their product line design? Well, Max, I think the mandolin declined around 1920 possibly because of the effects of World War I, and perhaps the Gibson Company was trying to breed an era of innovation to give more life to the mandolin. And perhaps it was because of the presence of Lloyd Lohr. Mm -hmm. Lloyd Lohr was an acoustical engineer who was quite well versed and studied in the acoustics of music. He was also a performer, a lecturer, a writer. He had worked with the Verzi brothers in New York and also in Palermo, Italy, before coming to Gibson. When he came to Gibson in 1919, theoretically he was there to replace Orville Gibson, who left in 1917 because of health problems. So Lloyd Lohr, as the new acoustical engineer, entered into a factory that must have been very exciting. Lewis Williams and Guy Hart were on Lohr's staff as foreman in the factory itself. And they came up, as a group, they came up with such remarkable innovations. We have decided to separate this Lohr influence period into three groups of instruments. One is the Lohr models, style A. The other is the artist model, style F4, F2, H4, and K4, and also style F5, the master model. Style 1 is represented behind me here in a beautiful collection of blackface instruments. The mando bass, the largest of the mandolin family, had appeared much earlier. This particular one fits nicely with this lore era set. The mandocello, the next largest, is the K1. Style K was the mandocello designation. The mandola is the H1. And finally, the smallest member of the mandolin family, style A1, which we have in the form of a beautiful snakehead. The other innovations that were going on in the Gibson factory were designed toward playability. These innovations include an adjustable truss rod in the neck to make the neck adjustable and the adjustable bridge which now makes string height adjustable. To players these adjustments are so important because things like climate will affect your instrument and how it plays and to be able to adjust that from place to place is is really a handy development. Tony, you talked about uh, the Verzi brothers a while ago and that Lloyd Lohr had worked for them before he came to Gibson. We hear an awful lot about an invention called a Verzi that Lloyd put in the mandolins and I wonder if you could explain what that is exactly. Sure, the Lloyd worked for the Verzi brothers and came away from that experience with ownership to the rights of the Verzi. Hmm. When he came to Gibson, he had uh, the, the full rights to the Verzi. As a matter of fact, I have a Verzi right here that actually came out of a master model F5 that we'll be seeing later on. Hmm. This is what it is. This is a piece of spruce here. Very delicate. Very delicate, very thin piece of spruce with sound holes. Mm -hmm. And little feet, almost like a violin bridge. Little feet. And how did it attach? Was it attached to the top facing down or to the bottom facing up? Well, I actually have a mandolin that we pulled out of the shop that needs some interior work. And the back is uh, loose here. 
a little bit of shop dust there. And uh, I'll show you exactly how the Verzi went in. It attached to the underside of the top of the mandolin. See, the, I see. it suspends inside the instrument, suspends down from the underside of the top, and what it is is a secondary vibrational surface. It's like another soundboard. And theoretically, according to the uh, work that Lohr did and the, the theories and uh, acoustical theories that he had, this little creation increased the frequencies, amplified certain frequencies by being a secondary vibrational surface. I think you can really tell it in the upper and even the lower frequency range that it does work. However, the, the device is really out of favor with a lot of especially bluegrass players because the very presence of this glued to the top dampens the volume, mm -hmm. reduces the volume of the instrument. But you really don't have to take my word for it because we have a rare opportunity here to compare similar mandolins with and without Verzi. Well, I was hoping you would. Is this one of them? Right, the black face snakehead does not have a Verzi. Okay. See, see what it sounds like. Lots of volume. And sustain. <laughs> the, uh, the Sunburst Snakehead, style A4, meaning A4 gives it a little more fancy appointment, but basically the same mandolin with, with a Verzi installed. seems to be mellower and a little bit more complex, the tone. Good, good. The, the, the Verzi actually adds to the tone, but cuts down on volume. I think mm -hmm. that's our bottom line here. We will be able to do another comparison with the artist model from mm -hmm. the Lure era. Incidentally, Gibson also made an economy model called the A Junior. I believe you've got one over there, don't you, Max? I do have one. This uh, looks an awful lot like the design and shape of the, of the Gibsons of that era, but it just isn't quite as fancy. It doesn't have any binding around the fingerboard or doesn't have any ornamentation up on the peg head, and the, the tailpiece is just a little bit plainer. Mm -hmm. But this is the mandolin. This is the kind of mandolin that the great Howard Fry played throughout his career and made all those wonderful gypsy and mandolin classical records. Oh boy, and he sure got a great tone, didn't he? He certainly did. He made that little A Junior sing. He certainly did. Tony, the artist model with the Florentine headstock and the Florentine body design has been around since Orville's handmade models about the turn of the century. What is the difference in the artist models in the lower period? Well, as in the A models, the adjustable bridge and the truss rod were added, which made the instrument more playable. I really think that's about the main difference between the lower era instruments and the ones in the late teens. The desirability of these lower era instruments are intertwined with the playability, but a lot of folks seem to think they sound better. That may uh, have had something to do with the truss rod. By now, we have An example of the K4. Well, that's the big daddy. <laughs> and this is a very early Gibson adjustable bridge with an aluminum saddle. They tried that aluminum saddle, I believe, for a couple of years on several of the instruments. They were custom making mandolins for Dave Apollon, and that was one of his preferences. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the aluminum saddle quickly gave way to the ebony saddle, very good, mm -hmm. like we see 
on the typical F4 from the period. One other big difference is, again, the availability of the Verzi, to Verzi or not to Verzi. You could uh, choose to have a Verzi put in your F4 or not. And we have an opportunity here to compare F4s with and without. This mandolin that I'm holding is a 1923 F4 without Verzi. <laughs> Sounds beautiful. Does it get better? Well, let's see what it does when you stick the Verzi in there. Once again, the secondary soundboard is under the top of this mandolin, suspended inside. I would say the same thing about that. More mellow and more complex tones. Before we leave the artist model from this period, I would like to perform on the mandola, one of my favorite tunes, Dola Dance. Terrific. Thus far, Tony, we've been talking about the redesign of the existing Gibson product line, the A models and the F models that were already being produced by Gibson that were enhanced by Lohr. He then introduced an entirely new concept, a new design, with new architectural and acoustic properties, didn't he? Ah, yes, the master model. This is a 1923 Gibson F5 the master model mandolin designed by the Gibson Company and signed by Lloyd Lohr himself on the labels inside. This instrument not only incorporated some of the design improvements that we have already talked about, including the truss rod and adjustable bridge, but it really saw the final step in the evolution of the mandolin toward the violin design. Notice the arch top and the F holes. Mm -hmm. The violin F hole is now for the first time on a mandolin. And to do this, the tone chamber of the instrument had to be redesigned. And instead of the crossbar brace like the oval hole mandolins, the F5 has tone bars. Let me show you what I mean. Mm -hmm. To support the weight of the strings inside the mandolin, there are two wooden braces. On the oval hole mandolin, the braces run this way. On the F holes, the braces run at a diagonal, sort of parallel to the F holes. But you didn't refer to it just as a brace, you called it a tone bar. It's a tone bar because it's carefully carved, and that combined with the tap tuning of the top 
makes the instrument the most acoustically resonant that it can be. By mm -hmm. tap tuning, I've seen luthiers at work, and when they carve this top, they're carving with carving knives, and they're tapping that thing, flexing it, seeing what kind of stress it will hold up and what kind of sounds it makes even way before the strings become attached. So every, every top has its own innate resonant frequency, and they're trying to find just the, the right one. Is that right? Depending on the particular piece of wood, you can have two pieces of wood out of the same tree, and they will have to be carved slightly different. And the only way to do that is by using your ear, mm -hmm. or the only way that the guys I know do it. <laughs> the other design improvements, as I pick up this 1924 Gibson mm -hmm. F5, also signed by Lloyd Lore, the other design improvements we see is the elevated fingerboard. Mm -hmm. The fingerboard extension here uh, carries the fingerboard and the frets well above the vibrating surface of the top giving more area for vibration and a longer scale for playing. The length of neck brings the bridge to the center of the top, right in the center of the F-holes, which makes for a more acoustically designed speaker-like effect. Well, the result was certainly worth it because these are some of the finest sounding mandolins in the world. Well, we have an opportunity here to compare the two mandolins, the 1923 Gibson F5, without Verzi once again, and the 1924 Gibson F5, which typically had a Verzi. In 1924, almost all the mandolins received the Verzi's. So let's try this comparison, Max. If all you'll right. hold the 24, I'll see if I can play the 23 a little bit. The 1923 Gibson F5. see how it could possibly sound any better than that, but let's try 1924. I tell you what, Max, let's try it with the same song. All right. And, and get a good comparison here. The 1924 Gibson F5. In January of 1925, Lloyd Lore left the Gibson Company. Have you heard any rumors about such a thing? Well, I'd heard that he did that because he felt his work was done, and he was uh, interested in taking up uh, production of electrical instruments, which were just starting. 
at that time. That's true. There is a rumor that circulates among musicians that Lohr was fired from the Gibson Company for inventing the electric bass. Well, we do know that he took out a patent on an electric bass in 1924, but the rest is from the rumor mill. Mm -hmm. When Lohr left the company, the F5 changed slightly at first. I have a fine example of the late 20s F5. You'll notice the peg head difference. The fern inlay now became standard on the F5, whereas the lower era F5s almost always have the flower pot. This fern inlay mandolin was the model preferred by Dave Apollon and is seen in a lot of his great movies and heard on his incredible recordings. The bright sound of the fern, which a lot of people feel is contributed by changes in the varnish formula, was preferred by Apollon and helped him sing out way above the orchestra. Another point is Apollon took advantage of the high scale. And he actually had his fingerboard extension doctored a little bit to make that easier for him. It's, a, it's sort of a secret, but I guess I'll let it out. I've had mine slightly doctored in the same way, and this was done by Jim Triggs in 1990. Jim worked for the Gibson factory, mm -hmm. which still produces mandolins and has fine luthiers like Jim Triggs. And Jim gave me some little position markers down there in my fingerboard extension, which allows me to play in the upper registers. So let's give it a try. Great. Tony, I don't know whether it's you or the mandolins, but every one of them sounds better than the next one. They're, they're just <laughs> marvelous. What, what would one of these have cost if a fellow bought it back in 1923 or 24? Well, you know, I've got a flyer from that period. The master mandolin. Let's open mm -hmm. it up and uh, see what the price is. Right there we have it, $250 for the mandolin, $275 with this beautiful case. My gosh, I guess it would probably be two or $300 more if you wanted to buy it today. Uh, give a call. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what would one of these instruments run if you, if you happen to find one uh, in good shape today? One of these mandolins would probably cost more than a new Cadillac. I better not drop this then, Hannah. <laughs> well, I guess they're worth it. In the hands of a magician like you, they sound just terrific.
Thanks. Well, Tony, that describes what Lore did to the mandolin itself. What about the rest of the family, the mandola and the mandocello? You know, the mandolin was in a decline. Ironically, by the time Lore made all these incredible advances, or rather the Gibson Company made all these incredible advances during the Lore years, mm -hmm. the mandolin had given way in popularity to the banjo and later the guitar. However, they still made the mandola and mandocello, and in fact, the master model mandola and mandocello are exquisite instruments. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lower sign master model cello here, but what we do have is something from a later period that I think approximates the sound and look of the lower mandocello very well. well. That must be this one. Let me show you what this thing sounds like. Well, they, by that time, they had uh, built a pretty sophisticated guitar, and they s simply took a guitar frame and built a cello. Actually, the guitar evolved at the same time. This was the master model guitar, L5, mm -hmm. which uh, was the exact same body shape as the K5 mandocello, mm -hmm. the only difference being the neck and the amount of strings and tuners. Ironically, the K5 mandocello is little more than a footnote in history because of its rarity, and the L5 guitar became the industry standard. Mm -hmm. What a tragedy that it was just at this time when they were producing perhaps the most acoustically perfect instruments that they could, that the depression came along and the mandolin declined in popularity. Well, there's a new renaissance in mandolin playing and mandolin building, and maybe a few more folks hear these wonderful style five mandocellos, maybe we'll see some uh, return. Maybe they will after you play that. Are you going to play <laughs> us a tune on yeah, that? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Tony, the 20s were exciting times for Gibson and for mandolin players in general. But despite the impact that the Depression and the upsurge of interest in banjos and guitars had on Gibson's production plans, they did keep building mandolins, didn't they? Oh, yeah. They did continue to build mandolins and sell mandolins. But to give you an idea, their catalog went from 180 pages 
the first hundred or so devoted to mandolins down to a 20-page catalog with mandolins on the back page. Really? I think a lot of the focus on banjo was due to the volume of the instrument, and the guitar replaced the banjo as the microphone technology came into being. Mandolin players still continued to play and to play these very fine Gibson mandolins, but Gibson did a few things <clears throat> to redesign their instruments. One important thing they did was redesign their peg head. Gibson redesigned the peg head to fit these 1930s-style Waverly tuners, which had a unique departure in that the round gear is now below the worm gear, thus the tension of the string pulls the two gears together, making it a more sturdy and more durable tuning machine. Gibson also made some very nice models, fewer models, like I said, but they made some very nice pieces like this 1936 F7. Mm -hmm. The body, you'll notice, looks a lot like the lower F5, but the neck is the short neck, like on the F2s and F4s. The tuners are the 30 style tuners that we were just talking about, and the inlays are guitar designs that uh, they were using on their many mm -hmm. guitar models that were popular at the time. Those look familiar. This is a great sounding mandolin and is identical to the one that Bill Monroe played with his brother Charlie. As the Monroe brothers, they toured through the South, including North Carolina, and played many schoolhouses and theaters. My grandfather, in fact, saw them at the old theater in Ramsour and would talk about the Monroe brothers. And Bill was playing a mandolin just like this one right here. Can you give us an idea of what that might have sounded like with one of Bill's tunes? I'll sure give it a whirl. I'm not sure I've ever heard Bill played any better than that himself. <laughs> that one you're holding there now, I guess, is an example of the continued evolution. I, I can see just from here a lot of changes that Gibson made in the later years. I think the, the guitar influence was very heavy here. All the bindings and appointments were the same as Gibson were using in their guitar styles. The instrument also became heavier. Mm -hmm. which meant they were having less attention to their carving. Another important thing in this period from late 40s and 50s is the almost complete disappearance of the mandolin family, the mandola and mandocello. I think I have a, about a 1940 mandola, and you'll see it looks quite different from the ones we have seen previously. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this is one of the very last mandolas that the Gibson Company ever built. It seemed like the mandolin almost became dormant, but there was a renaissance, largely through the efforts of the bluegrass players, a lot of which were inspired by Bill Monroe. Mm -hmm. And today we're very fortunate to have many fine luthiers making mandolins similar to the ones from the mid-20s that I enjoyed playing so much. That's a pretty one. This is built by Randy Wood of Savannah, Georgia. He's been building mandolins for over 30 years. 
He was in Nashville for years and built up quite a reputation. He's made mandolins for everybody from Bill Monroe to Roland White to a lot of fine players today. This mandolin is built very much like the old Gibson lures, complete with spruce, red spruce from the same forest mm -hmm. that Gibson got their spruce. And the maple is also very similar to what Gibson was using. One interesting thing is that most modern makers actually go back to the tuners because of the peghead design. They want that lower look as well as sound, and so they've actually regressed in tuner design to ensure that look. But these are fine mandolins and have plenty enough tone for about anybody. Certainly do. Well, it sounds like there's hope for the mandolin in the future, Tony. It's very exciting. Well, we very much appreciate your coming by and spending today with us, uh, explaining as much as you have. This has been a revelation and an education for me and I hope for our audience. And a pleasure for me. I always enjoy talking about and playing fine vintage mandolins. I've got to ask you, though, could you play just one more before you go? <laughs> okay, let's see what we can do. Thank you.